Well, is it too late now to say sorry? Apart from being a very catchy lyric by... expecting people to... Justin Bieber, thank you. Oh, right. oh, no. I was expecting the young'uns to, to know. But... I mean, it was, it was all the way back in 2015, so... Yeah, a lot has happened since then. It is a, it is a boy. But he was singing it when he was about 12, so... Uh, but, but it's actually a really good question, isn't it? Uh, it deals with, in a very simple way, the, the complexities of relationship uh, that we all have to deal with at times. Uh, it acknowledges that something wrong was done, and I think Liz, Liz's story was very helpful here. Something wrong was done, someone was hurt, there needs to be an apology or some sort of change implied, and... There's a question about whether it will succeed. Will it restore relationship? Is this relationship beyond repair? Is saying sorry actually going to do anything? And that is kind of our poll this morning, but it's also our poll in this passage. Because the desired outcome is that there will be restoration. That the relationship will be somehow mended or repaired. Uh, but could it happen? Is there a chance? Is sorry going to be enough? And as we've discovered in this series in Genesis, Jacob's family are a much bigger mess than Liz's family. Um, was that a real story? <laughs> it's just sorry. <laughs> but Jacob's family. What a mess. What chaos. And no one in the family is without fault. And yet, because of God's goodness and faithfulness, they're still looking forward to something better. Uh, part of this healing and change is, is, is perhaps uncovering some of the sins of the past, coming clean, if you will, in order to create the necessary opportunity for this better way. For some restoration to happen. But the first step is a bit messy, but it is about coming clean. Uh, many families have stories, don't they? Where we've hurt each other, we've said things, and some of those things continue. Uh, I'm sure many families have a story where, where Granny hasn't spoken to Aunt Jane since Christmas 1972 because she insulted the cooking, something like that. And we think, well, time will heal wounds. But often time doesn't heal wounds. It's best to get it out in the open. Of course, in the right, safe context, but, but out nonetheless. I, uh, I remember when I was about 12 and I was in a year seven class and I yelled something at the teacher really rudely and he didn't know it was me. And he said, right, well, the whole class is going to stay in until the person who said it admits it. And did I admit it? No, the whole class stayed in. <laughs> and as we were walking out, someone came up to me and said, I know it was you. <laughs> and that was 30 years ago. And I still, I still remember it. <laughs> that it, you know, it wasn't what I'd said was wrong, but it was the, the fact I hadn't come clean. And that actually caused a lot more hurt than and the problem itself. And that, that's the pattern of the Bible, is to expose it so that healing may happen. Uh, Adam and Eve, that's how it begins. They try to hide in the garden from God. And God brings it out in the open. He says, where are you? He, in fact, asks this, what is this that you have done? <laughs> he knows what they've done. So what about the brothers of Joseph? Well, as we've looked at, and if you are not as familiar with the story, here's a bit of a timeline. Joseph's older ten brothers were jealous of him uh, and his father's favouritism. So uh, he was about 17 years old when they plotted to kill him. 
And they initially threw him down a well or a pit, and then they sort of relented a little bit and they sold him off into slavery, but effectively they left him for dead. They went to the effort of tearing his robe, dipping it in animal's blood, taking it to their dad and saying that Joseph had been attacked and killed. <laughs> Meanwhile, all of the brothers continue along with their lives, but they make a complete mess of them. God's with Joseph. Joseph gets sold into slavery. He becomes very prosperous. And last week, uh, we looked at how he gets unfairly accused and gets thrown into prison. So by this stage, it's about 10 years later, he's about 28 or so, and for a, at least two years, he's in prison, unfairly. But God uses that situation uh, with some dreams and interpretation, and he comes before the Pharaoh, and eventually he gets out of prison and rises up to second in command of the whole nation. And part of those dreams is that he foretells seven years of uh, prosperity followed by seven years of famine. At around 37 years of age, so it's 20 years after his brothers threw him in that pit, this famine comes upon the land. And of course, the brothers need the food. It's 20 years of Jacob, the father, thinking their son was dead. And the starving brothers, the ten of them, not including the youngest brother, Benjamin, uh, who are all guilty of treachery and guilty of deceit. And in many ways, for 20 years, they've gotten away with it. But God is at work. Because of the famine, the brothers have to travel all the way to Egypt. They need grain and they come before prosperous Pharaoh. And who's there to greet them? Joseph himself who's been wisely storing supplies through those years of plenty, and Joseph recognises them, and they don't recognise him. Joseph's much older, he probably dresses, and he's talking like an Egyptian. He's certainly speaking in a different language. And the brothers would never have contemplated that the person before him was that same brother. They end up fulfilling Joseph's dreams he had as a teenager when they bow down before him. And Joseph wants to see, what does he want to see? He wants to see if they've changed. And he accuses them of being spies and he sends them back and forth to Egypt, uh, uh, back to Canaan a couple of times. But really, would they tell the truth? It's quite an amazing piece of storytelling. I encourage you to read the next couple of chapters as well. We couldn't read them all today. But let me draw your attention to one aspect here. In chapter 42. This idea of honesty. So in chapter 42, verse 11, the brothers say, we are all the sons of one man. Your servants, us, are honest men, not spies. Verse 19, Joseph says, well, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison and the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. They go back to Jacob, they recount the conversation and they say, we said to him, we are honest men, not spies. And in verse 33, they said, the man who is Lord over the land said to us, this is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, take food for your starving households and go, but bring your youngest brother back so that I will know that you're not spies, but honest men. Then I'll give your brother back to you and you can trade in the land. Now, shall we take a poll? <laughs> Were the brothers honest men? Well, they have spent their last 20 years lying to their father. And here is their second chance. Joseph has kept another brother, Simeon, in prison, bound up. And now demands that they return with their younger brother, Benjamin. Will history repeat? Will they reject a brother again? Will they continue to lie? And in this case, they begin to get honest. They in fact tell the truth to Joseph. Your servants were twelve brothers, the son of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. 
And when challenged to produce this final brother, they discuss it among themselves. They said to one another, surely we're being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. And Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. It's all come back. 20 years later, there starts to be an acknowledgement that they're the ones who deserve the punishment. They, for all intents and purposes, had Joseph killed. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm aware of the un ongoing torment that unresolved relational breakdown can cause. Isn't it kind of, don't you have those things in your life? I mean, my little year seven example is so minimal, and yet it still sticks with me. Mistakes in our words and our actions in our past. And often it can be much worse than the initial problem ever was. Granny just needed to speak to Aunt Jane. Perhaps both confessing their part in the conflict. Otherwise it will destroy families and snowball into the rest of your life. Well, what happens with brothers? Well, they leave Simeon in prison. They go back and eventually... They get Benjamin before returning to Egypt a second time and Joseph has this silver planted in their sacks and this is back and forth. But really he's, he's, he's testing their honesty. God exposes their sin yet to not bring more guilt on them, to not rub their noses in it. Because they're, they're already feeling that, I think. But to actually facilitate healing. This is, this is what we learn about God. That, that God favours grace over guilt. I think our society is actually really struggling uh, in this space at the moment, in the form of cancel culture. Uh, if you're not aware of this term, it's often used against public figures when they've been caught out saying something they shouldn't have or doing something wrong and, and they get cancelled. Uh, that is, they, they get publicly shamed and shunned by the media. Uh, an example is J.K. Rowling recently. Um, she wrote some books, apparently. Uh, Harry Potter and the like. But she has some controvers controversial views on transgenderism, of all things. And then, so she said that, and then she gets destroyed in social media, and the bookstores are now pulling her books off the shelf because of what she said. They get cancelled. Uh, now it could just be when we, that's just a celebrity thing and a media thing. But it, but it starts to trickle down. Because you or I said something on Facebook in 2013 and now we can't get a job because it gets uncovered. Or you were labelled something on the first day of high school in year seven and it sticks with you. You can't shake that reputation. Now, on the one hand, it's good that we have a sense of justice. It's good that people are, are upset over wrong action. And it's right that some people have been called out because they've bullied or because they've said something racist or, or been inappropriate in their actions. Uh, I'm not justifying their words and actions. We should want justice. But taken to its extreme, is it too late to say sorry? Is there a point where we can actually say forgiveness is possible? Each action has the potential to cause, uh, cause one further pain, both for ourselves and for others. And perhaps instead of cancelling people, we need to rediscover the practice of confession. We need to rediscover God's grace. Our churches and Christian teachers, they've been rightly accused of presenting us with a God who's all about guilt. And you may have experienced that in the church, and I'm sorry if you have. But often it, 
it comes from a misapplication of rules. Like the, you get the Ten Commandments and other directions in the Bible. But then we discover that actually if you read the Ten Commandments, that, and we'll look at them in the next sermon series, in fact, uh, for one of our talks, they're all about how to live as God's people under His grace, when His grace has already come. And He's given us His goodness and forgiveness and freedom. And now it's, well, well, here's how to live in that freedom. Rather than this list of rules that if you disobey, you should feel guilty and shameful for. They're not a list of rules in order to get to God. They're rules for living as would uh, reflect best our lives under God's goodness. Now, of course, there are wise ways to live, and we should do well by living by them. It's good not to lie. It's good not to put slugs down your sister's jumper. But God's desire in exposing our mistakes is not to heap shame and guilt on us. It's not to do that. Exposing the brother's sin here is not about rubbing their noses in it. It's about allowing them for the opportunity for grace and forgiveness. Now the brothers still deal with the consequences. There's still issues and relational problems between the dad. They're still scared of Joseph later on when they find out that he's alive. But once their lies are acknowledged, the family is able to come back together. And we'll discover next week that God's been in control the whole time. And Joseph could have just put them all in prison. <laughs> he certainly was powerful enough. But as we'll learn next week, instead of that, he throws a big party. <laughs> Which I think is a great example of God's character. And we'll look forward to Jeff's sermon wrapping up the series next week in the family reunion. But for now, I think Proverbs is very helpful for us. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Confession, admitting our mistakes before God. Allowing healing between us and God allowing for reconcilia reconciliation of relationships, removing that weight that can hold us down, and often for years, and leaving room for God to show mercy. Sometimes it's good just to come clean, especially with God. Uh, you may or may not be aware that many churches, including uh, the Anglican tradition, of which we're a part of, has a practice of confessing sins in churches, publicly. Now, it doesn't mean that we invite everyone up and just everyone shares all the gory details of their life. <clears throat> we're not here to shame people. But we have a practice of saying prayers together, not because they're special words, necessarily, but because they teach good habits. That we have the opportunity to come before God to admit that we've strayed, and all of us have, so that healing and forgiveness may come. Now, I can't tell you all what your mistakes are. I don't want to uncover all your past all the time. But I can tell you that we all have things to bring before God in our personal lives, in our relationships, when we haven't lived by God's ways or we haven't best reflected his best life for us. Sometimes they've been really deliberate and hurtful. Sometimes they've just been unintentional. Sometimes they've had serious consequences. Sometimes we're just holding on to things that we, we don't want to admit or we haven't thought of others or we've been selfish or we've been impatient or we've been unforgiving and... <clears throat> But it's not, it's not about keeping a list. It's just about turning to God and allowing him to speak into our lives and to heal us and change us. It's about being honest. 
But you also might know that there's a second part of the prayer, not just when, when we confess our sins, but it's often the official term is an absolution, but really it's an assurance of forgiveness, which is usually simply a section of scripture, again, that we have as a habit in our lives, that God is good. Now, an example is, Liz actually already read this this morning, is from Psalm 103. As far as, as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, here's a question for the kids, all right? How far is the east from the west? Yep. I can't hear you. You're going to have to... A long way? <laughs> no map? Gave it a go. Mm. Alright. Now think about this. If you keep going north, and you hit the North Pole, and keep going, what starts to happen? Go you start going south. <laughs> right? But if you go east, do you ever start going west? No. Oh, no. See? As far as, as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. <laughs> You're not going to remember anything else today, are you? <laughs> if you keep going east, you will never start going west. As far as, as the east is from the west, so far will God remove our transgressions. Will God forgive us? Will God show his grace to us? In other words, it's, it's infinity. It'll never stop. What an amazing promise. God is about grace and forgiveness and healing. Even this group of brothers, they've been living with this lie for 20 years. And there's countless other examples in the Bible from, from David who completely stuffed up to Peter who rejected Jesus in, into his face. To Paul who killed Christians. And God said, I'm going to change you. And change, even from this group of chaotic brothers, is possible. Now, a third point is to acknowledge the difference between cheap and costly forgiveness and grace. Uh, it's a concept that's written about by Bonhoeffer in, the, in Germany in the 30s and 40s. But I think it, it's just a good reminder as for us today as well. It's a good concept for us to remember. Uh, that often we can approach this kind of forgiveness really cheaply. It's where we say, well, well, thanks God. Well, Jesus died for my sins. Well, I just need to believe in him. And now I can live however I want. I can get on with my life. Nothing's going to change. It's like a uh, it's like a get out of jail free card. A few monopoly games going on these holidays. It's live how you want, do what you want, and I'm just going to play the Jesus card and say, "Well, Jesus forgives me." It's like we play the Christian card, but we don't really repent in our hearts. And I think that's what we're talking about when we say we're sorry, but it depends. <laughs> When our heart's not really in it. Costly grace is where we recognise what it has cost the other party. In this case, God himself. Costly forgiveness and grace is looking at Jesus and recognising what our sin means before him. What he did in order to bring us forgiveness. It's what Paul reminds us in Corinthians when he says, You are bought at a price. Now, Reuben, the brother of Joseph, the eldest, he rightly recognises that he and his brothers will have to give an account. This has come back to bite us, he says. And in the Old Testament, we see a practice of sacrifice, where God's people would admit their sins, often they would confess, just like we do. But then something would have to die in their place, a, a lamb or a goat. 
And sometimes they'd symbolise that by actually placing, or the priest would place his hands on that lamb. And so that's what it cost. This lamb or goat would, would have to die in our place. That's what it cost. But of course that was just a symbol. It, it, it's an insufficient symbol. The lamb couldn't really take away that sin. But it becomes a reality when Jesus dies as a lamb. And so yes, grace is free. Forgiveness is free. We live in the freedom of that. But it cost. Our sin cost Jesus. And so we hold these truths together that forgiveness, the, the gift of grace that says if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, from the east to the west. But that forgiveness is possible because Jesus went to the cross. So don't take it for granted. Is it too late now to say sorry? Well, not with God. It's not too late. God doesn't want to cancel us. He wants to forgive us. God doesn't want to weigh us down with guilt. He wants to shower us with grace. God doesn't want us to treat his grace with contempt, though. He wants us to live in the light of Jesus and all that he's done. The Apostle Paul, who persecuted Christians and was violent towards them, experienced this grace and transformation firsthand. He knew the grace, he knew the freedom that it brought, but he knew the cost. And he said this to Timothy, and may these words be ours this morning. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.